Genesis chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 1 through 8. Please listen carefully, for this is God's word. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I gave, give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Thus the reading of the word. So in Genesis here, what we have is a theophany. And what a theophany is, is when God actually appears to you in some type of form. And God appears to Abraham here, it says in verse 1. And he, he's, it, it, what it is, is what we have here is probably the most complete presentation in Genesis of the covenant promises and what's expected of them in, in uh, Genesis 17. And there are several statements, you notice this pattern here as we go through Genesis, that have not been previously revealed. He's like adding more in depth of what this covenant is. And now Abraham's told he's going to be a father of many nations, and that kings are going to come from him, and that it's an everlasting covenant. Now, the Lord could have said all this the first time he manifested himself to Abraham. But you know how the Lord kind of works? I've been thinking about this. Is the more you, you're in the faith, the more you're obedient to him, the more that you study his word, the more that you're faithful in prayer, your prayer life, the more he reveals to you. And so that's the privilege that we have as children of God is that he reveals more and more of himself. It's not that he's holding anything back. He's just revealing what we can understand at that time. And so there's also going to be name changes, finally, for Abraham and Sarah. And, there's, and God's going to tell them, too, that about the uh, designation of circumcision. And, and he's going to make a reference to keeping the covenant. Now, we look at this, and, and we have to remember that after Ishmael's birth, God was silent for 13 years. In the last verse of chapter 16, Abraham is 86. And now the first verse of chapter 17, he's 99. And so you have to wonder, this long silence could have been to test Abraham's faith, or possibly a penalty if you want to use that word, of impatience of not waiting on God. Personally, I think it's both. I think it's both. I think whenever the Lord, first of all, I, I went going over this this morning, God's never silent. Okay? And so when I say he was silent for 13 years, that, that means he's always speaking to us, always. He's either speaking to you through your circumstances, he's speaking to you through you through your prayer life, speaking to you every time you open the word of God. He speaks to you in the inner chambers of the heart where only he has access. But what happens, personally, it happened to me, and I think it happened to Lois, and probably other people in Sunday school, God, out of his own, it's Good Friday again, out of his own good pleasure, decided to draw us closer to him. And that's why we got what we got out of the teaching today, if you know what I mean. And I think we can't capsulize that and say, I always feel this drawn close to God all day long, because we don't. It's just like when we're up, when Peter and uh, John and James were up on the Mount of Transfiguration, they didn't want to leave. 
You know, they were they were in the presence of God intimately like they'd never been before. Remember, Peter, let's, let's stay up here. Let's make three tents, tabernacles here. We want to stay up here. But they had to come down off that mountain. And what's the first thing they encounter is unbelief. And so God gives us those special times when he draws us close to him. But he wants, it's like a little child, but he wants us to walk on our own, if, if lack of a better description. So don't, it's like a drug for some people. It's like, I want to have that intimate experience all day long. Of course we do. And you're going to get it when you're in heaven. But now, in order for us to grow in the faith, he has to pull himself away. He's always with us. Don't get me wrong. But we, he'll give us those benefits at times where he just draws us even closer. So God is never really silent. But it's the only way that I can explain this. And so what happens is, remember Abraham tried to, he listened to Sarah, okay? And they did it, I feel for Sarah, if anything, because here Sarah's way past childbearing. And God told Abraham, the seed's going to come through you. Meaning, he's a faithful man. He's got Sarah as his wife. Sarah knows she's going to be the chosen vessel to, to extend the line. But 13 years, or how many years passed? 10 years, and nothing's happening. Sarah's getting older. And so Sarah, because she wants to be part of this promise so much, tells Abraham, maybe go into Hagar. Maybe that's what God wants, to get the seed you know, through her. And so they take a shortcut. They don't wait on the Lord. And now you have 13 years of silence here, if you want to call it silence. And Ishmael, you know, now you look at yourself as in Abraham's position. Remember what it said last, last week, Ishmael, it, the prophecy was he's going to be an untamed donkey or whatever they said, an untamed nature. Yeah, that's all of us. When you're born into this world, we have sin. And we have an untamed nature, just like Ishmael. Ishmael, so <coughs> Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar had to live with Ishmael these 13 years. Untamed nature. <laughs> and you know, you parents, you know how that goes. But anyway, uh, uh, it, all I'm saying when I see in this is that we all have that untamed nature until what happens, until we accept Christ as our Savior, and he changes us. We're born again. He's given us a new nature now, and, and people recognize that. Just like if Ishmael ever got saved, they're going to see the difference because it was untamed nature now to the, the, this nature that's obviously been changed. It's what we call a witness. It's what we call being born again. Judy doesn't see it in herself most of the time. Mary Ann doesn't. Joyce doesn't. But I guarantee you other people in your circle see the difference in you. And that's the witness that we have. If text always saw, always compared himself to himself throughout life, you know, we're supposed to at times, you know, don't get me wrong, and, and, and walked around puffed of how much he's changed, that wouldn't be much of a witness. But if other people tell text, wow, You've really changed. And non-believers, they're going in their mind, did you go to counseling or something or some secular means? And then, of course, text would say, no, I'm born again, and that ends the conversation. <laughs> but it's been almost so, at this point, it's been almost 23 years since the initial promise. So we got to think of Abraham and, and Sarah. It's been 23 years. And, and on top of that, it's the last 13 years the promise probably seemed even more distant to him. You know, you got Ishmael. Is, see, this, what's going on here? Sarah is still barren. And so God had given Abraham a long time to think about his sin and his lack of trust. But in reality, the Lord is growing his faith, and he doesn't even realize it. Just like Wade doesn't realize God is working in him to grow his faith. Always consumed with this sin that he just committed, and that God's chastening, chastening him, and that oh, I, 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 I'll use myself because I'm perfect in this situation. <laughs> the Lord's convicted me of sin, and man, I'm never going to grow. I must have gone backwards. And what's going on here? Why did I commit this sin? And on and on and on. In reality, what the Lord's doing, He's growing your faith. 
and we don't even realize it. And that's what's happening with Abraham. He's actually, God's actually growing his faith. Look at verse 1 and 2. It says, uh, when Abram was 99 years old, see, it's been 13 years since verse 1. The Lord, I mean, verse 50, 16 in the last chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. So 13 years have passed and nothing worthy of remembrance had occurred in our reading of the scripture. But because the Holy Spirit selects things that are most important for our learning, it seems like 13 years have gone by without anything happening. But that's not what's happening, just like our life. When, when you think you've got, actually, routine is good, you know. I forget the saying of that, but routine is good. When you can go through life for three or four years and nothing really harsh, hard circumstances are upon you, be thankful for that. Be thankful because stuff gets turned upside down in a heartbeat. But anyway, but the Holy Spirit selects what he wants us to learn and so it's not like these 13 years has been completely silent. Perhaps, and this I say, I have to say perhaps because I don't know, perhaps Abraham became contented with Ishmael. And, and he ceased to desire any other seed. Maybe he started getting comfortable. Maybe the upcoming circumstances uh, helped Abraham refocus and wait for the promised spiritual seed. See, we don't know what was going on in those 13 years, but here's one thing. God appears to Abraham, and he says, I am almighty God. And so God's revealing a new name to Abraham. It's El Shaddai. It's one of my favorite names in Scripture. El Shaddai, if you ever hear the Amy Grant song, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, that's a good song. It means God Almighty. It signifies, it's describing God's power and sovereignty. And it's the name which the patriarchs are going to come to know God. Just remember what happened in, in, Gen, in Exodus 6 3? In Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Actually, I'll start in verse 2. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But my name, Lord, I was not known to them. And i got to read verse 4 because they were coming in handy. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage in which they were strangers. So he's saying, I'm God Almighty. And, 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 and Abraham hears the name for the first time, and it's a name that maybe Sylvia needs to get recognized really soon because it's in Job 31 times. <laughs> El Shaddai, you know, the whole Bible is 48 times. They use the name El Shaddai, 31 of them are in Job. Remember that, Sylvia. 31 times God refers to himself as El Shaddai to Job amongst his tribes. And here in Genesis, the name He's giving the name to Abraham. And God was teaching him. He was teaching him that he's God is able, and we all need to remember this, able to fulfill the promises of a people and the land despite Abraham's age. Despite Sarah being barren. I think she's at this point in her mid-80s. At this point, God is telling Abraham, my promise is still going to come true when I told you years ago. I don't care about your age. Quit looking at your age. Quit, Sarah, quit looking at your barrenness. And, and, there's, and don't try and, definitely don't try and fulfill the promise in the flesh through your own uh, meanderings. Don't, that's what we do. We Sometimes we look at our age as I'm getting older. I think about this all the time. We look at our age and we thought, oh, God can't use me. Absolutely not. Look at Abraham. Getting old is getting old's not for wimps. Period. It's not. 
And I'm telling you, we have more to offer the younger people than you think. We have experience. We have all those years walking with the Lord. We've gone through hard circumstances. And we can give them encouragement, just like people did when you were young. But the way we live is determined by the way we think of God. And that's why he's telling Abraham, I'm El Shaddai, all-powerful, all-sovereign. And so what you believe about God is the most important thing in your life. The most important thing in your life is what you do with God. And you know, when you uh, spend time reading the Bible, spend time coming here on Sunday, when people around the world spend time coming to worship on Sunday, because it's the most important thing is God to you in life. There's billionaires, millionaires, people that make as much as we do down there on the totem pole. I'm talking about all humanity. You can tell who they are by what they hold most important in their life. It could be the stock market, it could be sports, it could be sex. It, whatever Whatever's most important to them drives them. And yes, we are a peculiar people as Christians, beloved. Because what drives us is God, is El Shaddai. And you're never going to be, don't ever be embarrassed with that. And the day that he takes us home, you're going to be thankful that that is what drove your life with God Almighty. And here's the other thing that I saw here is for Sylvia, when she <laughs> gets defensive all the time about, we have to, I forget how you say it, you're right. We have to pursue holiness. We can't use an excuse for it. It, it, there's a tension there. Mary Joe's right too. There is a tension in Scripture that you're never going to be perfect, but God wants you to keep striving for that perfection. You have to keep striving, and that's when you get that tension in in Scripture. That's it's it's there for that reason. Now some people are going to use attention in a different way and say you can lose your salvation. That's not what it's. It's like warning passages is what they call it. It's to keep us. Alert and on our toes is the best way. So Enoch, I mean, look at, where is it, verse 2. He says, I will make my covenant between me and you will multiply your seed. No, he says in verse 1, walk, he says, I am almighty God, walk before me. He says, walk before me. Remember Enoch, back in wherever that was, and it's in Exodus, Genesis 5, when he says, Enoch, walk before with God, like side by side type thing. Now, oh God Almighty is telling Abraham, walk before me, before me. And so he's saying your conduct in life is on open display of your faithfulness to me. You're a walking testimony. Walk before me and let everybody see my work in you, is what he's saying. And that's the great responsibility that we have, contract that we have with the Lord, is that our life should be pleasing in his sight and a witness to other people. But verse 3, it says, Then Abram, after he heard all this, fell on his face, and God talked with him. You know, Abraham falls, you picture this, God appears to him, and God, and he falls face down on his face and acknowledges God. And he's in all presence, and you know what? We should be doing that more and more. We should have that holy experience with the Lord in your uh, alone time with the Lord or, or, or corporate fellowship. And it should drive us to our face. It does more than you think. It does. You know, we're hard on ourselves, but it does. And the Lord's love, it humbles us when we start thinking of him. Our heart is bowed low, let me put it that way. But look at verse 4 and 5. It says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. So in Hebrew thought, and this might clear up some of the scriptures, I think of David and, and uh, Abigail, when uh, Abigail's husband was called Nabal. Remember the one that wouldn't give food to David and his men, and then God struck him down. He died of a heart attack, a stroke. 
Nabal means in Hebrew means foolish. Name means fool. It means fool. Nabal, to be a fool. Now, no parent's going to name their child Nabal when they're born. <laughs> Foolishness. But in, in, in the Hebrew thought, a change of name symbolizes the transformation of character and destiny. And I think this is what the Catholics get, where God's going to change your name when you get to heaven. They might have something there, I don't know. But, but in the psychology of the Near Eastern world back then, a name was not only a convenient means of identification, but it was, that's what we, how we use it today, identification. But it was intimately bound up with the personality and presence, essence of, of the being of the person. So I think when Nabal, like when scripture calls him Nabal, I think that's what they call him after his foolish character is manifested. They, I don't think the parents called him Nabal, but <laughs> Abram, Abram uh, God's changing his name to Abraham. And, and it says in Revelation, you know, God gives each one of us a name that nobody else knows but us. And I think, my opinion only, I think when Brenda gets to heaven, God's going to give her that special name that sums her up of her relationship with God. Anyway, it's something to think about. In verse 6 and 7 it says, And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make mention nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So my Hebrew professor, I've said this before, would, would tell me that this word qualm, if I'm saying it right in Hebrew, is the word where you really get how God works sovereignly. And, it, and in this, it's in verse 7, it's the word that's... Uh, translated from establish, establish. They're using that one Hebrew word. And what it's saying is, is, is that God is the one that establishes or initiates the covenant. God maintains it, and he, he brings it to fulfillment. It's a work of God's grace. Use that for salvation. God holds Irma into the kingdom. God maintains his, not your faithfulness, but his faithfulness with Irma. And he fulfills it by bringing you to heaven. And nothing's going to cut that knot anywhere. And so God's blessing and promise are unconditional. And they depend not on the capabilities of Abraham, but on the faithfulness of God. That God's going to keep this covenant with Abraham. That God's going to keep Connie faithful to the end, even though she may at times fall into sin. Because it's not about her capabilities, it's about God's faithfulness. What does it say in 2 Timothy chapter 12, chapter 2, 12 and 13? If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. So Mary Ann is born again. She's in the kingdom of God. She's Christ's bride. God will never cast Marianne out of the kingdom because he cannot deny himself because the Holy Spirit's in her. <coughs> anyway, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. It's God working in us. Uh, verse 8, it says, Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger. All the land of Canaan is an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So kings are going to come from Abraham's seed or Abraham's covenant. That was unheard of back then. But here's the other thing. This is for Lois here. In Galatians chapter 3. 
in Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 through 10. You know, I didn't see this till Saturday. And it goes in with what Sylvie was teaching today. But Galatians chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, let me read that. And remember what we just read back in Genesis. It says, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. This is what he's doing back in Genesis 17. Saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. See, God's going to include the Gentiles. That's why he says all the nations, not just one nation, but all the nations will be blessed through you, Abraham. Uh, staying in Galatians chapter 3. Uh, see, Paul's making an argument here in Galatians that God made a covenant of promise with Abraham long before he gave the law to Moses. We have to remember that. Look at verses 15 through 18 in Galatians 3. It says, Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant. Yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say in the seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, into your seed, who is Christ. In this I say that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God and Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So what am I saying there? What's scripture saying there? What am I saying? What's scripture saying? That faith was the key to salvation long before the law was given to Moses in Exodus. That, remember, it's faith in the covenant, faith in God's righteousness, long before the law came. So it's not that God gave the law so people could save themselves or use the law for access. It's always been by faith. Always have been by faith. And uh, Romans. Hang on. Then. Hang on. Romans chapter 4, verse 1 through 5. Listen to these verses. Romans chapter 4, 1 through 5. Because he's talking about what we're reading in, in Genesis 17. What then shall we say that Abraham our father is found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and was accounted to him for righteousness. Accounted. It's my, one of my favorite words. It's a legal term. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And so, in, in, in Galatians 3 and, and, uh, no, and Romans 4, he's referring back to what we're reading in the Old Testament. And he's saying that all the Israelites that trusted in, in God's promise to Abraham and did not use the law as a way of salvation were assured of salvation. It's by faith in God. And I don't know, you probably haven't heard of what they call the new perspective. It's what they're teaching in seminary now uh, to be aware of. And it's about 30, 40 years ago, E.P. Sanders and several other people started saying, well, no, 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 you got it wrong here. Uh, uh, Israel didn't really think that works was a way to salvation. They just used it like boundary markers. I don't want to get into all that. But in reality, uh, it was a works mentality for most Israelites. They thought by keeping the law that, that in the end, when you died, God would weigh you on a balance. And if you kept Torah more than you disobeyed it, you were allowed into heaven. Okay, 
And when you think about it, there's always been a remnant. It has always been a remnant in Israel in the Old Testament. There's a remnant now. And there's even a remnant amongst Gentiles. I believe that. I didn't want to believe it. But I think it's only been a remnant that's been truly saved throughout history. Maybe the remnant's gotten larger during certain parts. But I have a feeling it's only been a remnant. Paul says that the remnant in Israel has always been saved. Because what when you sit there and go, well, you're... you're talking bad about the Israelites saying they were trying to keep the law in order to be saved. No, everybody does. Except for Christians. If you look at every single religion out there, it's a works mentality. It's something that you have to do. And it, 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 along with your faith in Christ. It could be living a certain righteous lifestyle along with believing in Jesus. You get into all the other different religions that just come out and say, that your deeds will be weighed when you die between good and bad. But in the Christian circles, people that call themselves Christians, let me put it that way, they can say, well, yeah, it's believing in Christ, but it's also being baptized. You have to be baptized in order to be saved. Or it's something to that extent of what the other... Uh, in the end, God's going to weigh you. It's still faith in Christ. That's no, no, it's not. It's faith in Christ alone. Because let me finish with Romans 4, 6, and 7. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from words. And it's that word impute. As I stand up here every Sunday, almost every Sunday when I do the altar call, and I say, it's something outside of you. It's when you believe in God, God imputes his righteousness to you. That's why you go to heaven. It's the only reason you go to heaven, because of Christ's perfect life. But he gives that to you outside of yourself. Because that's what David is saying in verse 7. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And that's that word. So in other words, when, when I accept Christ as my Savior, He gives me His righteousness. That's what covers me. And He takes my sin away. Even though I continue to sin at times, I'm still saved because of Christ's righteousness that covers me. And it's happened with David. It's happened with Abraham. And, it's, and it happens to us today. Only one way of salvation in the Old Testament, they believed in the coming Messiah. And now, in the New Testament, we believe in the Messiah has already come. We look back. They look forward and place their faith in God. We look back to the finished work of Christ and place our faith in, in Him.